welcome everybody, everybody to today's SEFM day. We have uh, a really exciting topics on the program and we start tomorrow, uh, today morning with Roberto. Roberto was born in Italy, he studied there, also made his PhD there on isomorphism of types. So he started in the theory. Currently he's a full professor in, Rome, uh, in um, uh, Paris and his um, research areas are extremely wide. So I'm very impressed. Uh, he is uh, theoretically um, very experienced functional programming, parallel distributed computing, semantics of programming languages, type systems as from the PhD, rewriting, linear logic, static analysis, so wide range. And recently he also moved towards a very important topic that is yet not as central as it deserves to be. And this is software, free software and how to handle um, related questions. And the talk of the title of his talk today is making software a first class citizen in the scholarly world. So I'm excited to listen what you have to say. Okay, Thank, thanks a lot Erika for the very kind words. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be with you today, even if uh, kind of uh, virtually. I hope next time it will be in presence. As Paula said yesterday, I have added Amsterdam in the location, well, okay, virtual location of the, of the conference today. I'm hoping that we, we will manage to go there tomorrow. Uh, I mean, tomorrow, yeah, some, someday in the future. So the, the idea today is to share with you a concern about importance, the importance of software. We are all studying software, developing software, providing the principles that allow us and everybody else to build better software. But what about software itself? And, and what can we do to make it a first class citizen in the scholarly world? Let me share with you a, a little bit of the work uh, I have been doing with my team over the past ideas and I hope to see more and more people getting interested in it. So the first observation is that, of course, and in particular today with the critical situation we are living in, everybody around us has discovered how software is important in our work. Like it, it is the fuel uh, of innovation, the engine for our, for our industry, it's a pillar for academic research, of course, so this is very clear. But uh, uh, unfortunately not many of the people around us know that software doesn't come out of the blue. It is not just something that you uh, run by pushing on a button in, in your uh, uh, phone. It is actually written by people, written by developers, written by experts in the form of software source code. Well, for us, of course, this is not new at all. I, mean, I remember when I was a student in Pisa, and, and Paula was one of my professors, by the way, uh, uh, I read a beautiful book by Jared Adelson, uh, which is Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs. And I remember that in the preface of the first edition, there is this beautiful phrase. He says, programs must be written for people to read and only incidentally for machines to execute. Well, of course, you can think this is a kind of a joke by uh, a professor telling the students, if you turn in a homework I cannot read, you will have a bad grade. But actually the observation is much deeper than that, is that software is in, in some sense, of course, source code, some, of course it is meant to be compiled and executed on a machine, but it is also a message sent from the original developer to the person that will need to fix a bug, to adapt it, to evolve it, to understand what is going on. And, and, uh, and this message is so clear today that we have uh, access to tons and tons of important pieces of jewels or soft, uh, software source code that were not available when R. Davidson wrote this book, because in the 80s, most of the source code was hidden behind closing doors in companies, right? But look at what we have access to today. So for example, this is a small excerpt of the source code of the Apollo guidance computer that actually helped uh, mankind put a man on the moon. And I would like to remember here that if we managed to put a man on the moon, it is thanks to a lady, uh, uh, Margaret Hamilton, that actually di directed the team of the programmers that wrote this. And if you look at this source code, on the left, of course, you recognize some old style assembler. But I would like to focus more on the right part, 
On the right part, there are the comments. You see, these are clear messages, not for the machine. They are sent to the other people that we have to actually understand what is going on in, uh, in, um, in, uh, when something goes wrong, for example. So, I mean, the, the, the code is, is very nice. I mean, if you look at it, it starts by checking. It is a piece of code which is executed when you go to the moon, you have the, the landing module that is approaching the surface of the moon. And, and if you remember the movies, because I mean, we have seen all of them, we saw that, uh, all of us, we saw that. Um, there is a point where you need to turn the lamb around, the module around, because uh, instead of looking at the moon, you want to avoid crashing. So you need to put, put the legs uh, on the bottom. Uh, so how does it work? I mean, it checks whether a certain antenna is a specific position, which is a way, a sensor, to tell you if you are already in the right position. If it is not, then you ask the astronaut to, to actually uh, turn the module around. Uh, then, I mean, for, for all, the, all the hackers like me, there is a, a funny way of actually calling a routine, and then you, if the answer is yes, you return to N plus one, otherwise you return to N plus two. Uh, and then, uh, so depending on the answer of the astronaut, you can abort the procedure or say, okay, he said I turned the lamb around. But in that case, you don't trust him. It is written, see if he's lying. And actually, you jump back to the routine to see if the antenna is still the, is in the right position. If it is not the case, you keep tagging the, the, the astronaut. Okay, that, that's, that's fascinating. There are other more recent pieces of software source code. For example, this is a small excerpt of the um, Quake 3 Arena game. Uh, I don't know if all of you remember that. I mean, think about uh, 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 Call of Duty, okay? The, these kind of things where some of our kids have spent too much time in a first person shooting. Well, forget for a moment about the, the game. The point here, it, this is a routine which is extremely important when you do um, uh, 3D animation or actually 2D and a half when, as it was in that case. And uh, here you need to compute one over the square root of X without using the floating point coprocessor because it was too slow at the moment to play the game. And actually, it will take you a full afternoon to understand what is exactly going on in here. And actually, the guy who reused this piece of code didn't necessarily fully understand what is going on. If you look at this comment here, I do not know if it show up, shows up, you see here. I will not pronounce what is written here, but essentially, uh, uh, if you are curious, just go and check for, for uh, just for this particular uh, hash number here. Um, uh, hash number, sorry, exact decimal number here, 5F3759DF in uh, Wikipedia, and there is a full, full page explaining what is going actually on there. Okay. Uh, why am I spending so much time on this? Uh, apart from the fact that it is beautiful. The, because I really want to convey the message that source code is much more than just an executable. And of course, all these comments, all this extra information, the names of the variables, the names of the function, the way software is written, this is not for the machine. This is for us, okay, to understand what is going on. So to, to put it like uh, Len Schustek, who is a, the, the board director of the Computer History Museum, a beautiful institution in, in uh, Mountain View that actually tried to rebuild the history of computing. Uh, he has a beautiful paper in 2006 in the Annals of, uh, of the History of Computing, IEEE. Uh, and he says, source code provides a view into the mind of the designer. See, so that, that's an incredible uh, observation that uh, unfortunately people that never saw those code have difficulty understanding. But now, I mean, there is more teaching of computing in, in high school, etc. So I hope that this kind of literature, technical literature of 21st century is going to be better appreciated by the next generations, our, our kids. Now, so another little bit of time to tell you about why I consider source code is so special. You know, we have been discussing with people which are interested in uh, open science in general, etc. And it is remarkable how even the word software is missing in most of the documents you see around in people talking about open science, or even at the European level, etc. Uh, they tend to tell you, well, uh, we, don't for we didn't forget. It is just that software is a special kind of data. Well, I pretend software is not a special kind of data. It's much more. So software evolves over time. Projects may last decades with big teams working on them. 
if you want to understand what is going on, you need to have access to the open list. You do not read one million lines of code from scratch. You need to know why a particular line of code is there. And this, this is in the version of the repository. The other part, it is extremely complex. Today, you have projects which are millions of lines of code, but you also have the case where a single line of code that you write for a particular application, which is interesting for you, actually pulls in, build upon tons of extra components you didn't write. So the, the, simple, the, the small picture you see on, on the right here of the screen is actually, uh, well, unless Zoom turns it out, I mean, the picture that you see in the, in the screen, uh, is just a, a visualization of the so many dependencies which are pulled in as soon as you type import matplotlib in, in Python, which is something a lot of data scientists do today. So there are sophisticated developer communities and also research software is just a thin layer on top of all the rest, which is developed by tens of millions of people around the world who are not scientists. And so the other point is that this is precious knowledge, a new form of precious knowledge, which is executable, but human readable, uh, where we didn't actually take care of it. We are not taking care of it. I mean, key people that wrote the original PC of source code on top of which, for example, the internet is built, are passing away and with knowledge, and, and we are not collecting this knowledge, uh, which is, dismaying for me because you know i mean for a mathematician if you could as a mathematician go back and talk to euler or to to leibniz or, or to these people it would be fantastic but they cannot we can go back and talk to the people that created all this field where we are working we should do it and then on the other side there are also platforms that all of us uh, uh, and all the developers worldwide use uh, without even thinking, I mean, these uh, code hosting platform which are shared around the world, uh, uh, there are tons of them we will see, which are closing down. I mean, 2015, Google Cloud, Cloud closed it down, Vitorios closed it down. That was one million and a half open source project in danger by a single business decision. I mean, could you believe this? And then there was no organized effort to catalog and archive all this knowledge. So this is a general observation. Then when you move to science, to, to our work, uh, what I told you, I mean, people talk a lot about open science, but 90% of our time is spent talking about open access and how to fix the mess where we are today with uh, commercial publishing that is actually preventing a lot of people from accessing knowledge. Then there is a small effort to, to talk about data. Actually, smaller, I mean, less visible than what you see about open access. And next to nothing about software. I pretend, we should pretend, the software source code is one of the three pillars of open science. There are not just two. It is not just data, article and data. It's article, data, and software. And of course, the link between them, how I can make sure in a paper that I mentioned that this particular version of software used on that particular status of the data has been used to compute a particular result that happens to be for people. So once you recognize this is a pillar of open science, then you can ask yourself, what are the needs that we need to address? And so there are a plurality of needs. I mean, if you are a researcher, think of ourselves just as researchers, forget about your heart as a department director or something like this. Well, I need a place where I can put the software which is associated to my paper or the software I'm developing and reference it in my article in such a way that I'm sure that it, the reference will stay there for the long time, will not go away. And I need to choose the best way of doing this. I want to find software which is useful of course, I would like to be credited for the work I'm doing if somebody else is reusing my software in their work. And when I get a, an article from somebody else that tend to have a particular result, I would like to just be able to check it, okay? Or build on top of what these people did and adapt it. You remember, I look, look at the comments and make changes and adapt it for my needs. This is as a basic researcher. Then you may be a, a, a team leader or, 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 or a dean, and, and then uh, you have other issues. Of course, so this becomes more administrative, so you need to have the web page with all the contribution from the departments, of course, the list of the papers, but also the list of software contribution. 
uh, for your reports. Ah, I forgot. Even a researcher, yes, you need uh, to write up your curriculum vitae, apply for funding, all this kind of thing. And you would like to have a structured way of presenting your software contribution, not ad hoc. And then if you are a funding organization or research organization, you need to track what are your software assets. Software is part of the production of, of research. So, uh, what about technology transfer? What, 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 what are we producing? And unfortunately, unfortunately, but we should not hide, I mean, metrics, okay? So who has the most influential piece of software? What are the five most influential software of your uh, university? This kind of thing, you know. It is just around the corner. It, it, it's not avoidable. So let, let's try at least to make it work as decently as we can and avoid the number game. We, we, we are victims in, in uh, publications. Well, that being said, unfortunately, the situation today is not ideal. So where do we stand? In software engineering and in, in, in computer science more in general, so I look at there because we are the expert in software, right? So we should be the guy to do, do the, 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 the best work. Uh, not really. So if you look at some literature in, in uh, software engineering, there is a paper by Zanier and, and others in 2006, actually analyze all the history of the uh, 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 conference and they found out there was not a single replication study. Uh, Carlo Gezzi gave a keynote in ICSE 2009 and, and he looked at uh, everything in, in TOSEM from 2001-2006 and out of all the papers that had uh, mentioned tools, only 20% had enough information to get tools that could be installed in some way, which is surprising. I mean, particularly in software engineering, come on, I mean, you should be expert, right? And then uh, there is a more recent work in 2015 by Christian Kohlberg where we actually he analyzed uh, over 600 papers from in, in a ton of the uh, most prestigious conferences and journals in applied uh, computing and, and there only 40% was installable. And the main reason is that source code or the right version of it could not be found. There was no main uh, way to but the situation is slowly changing. So around 2010, many communities they started to wake up and worry about this. I have to say that as far as I understand, unfortunately, this didn't start from us. It started from people in uh, applied mathematics and biology and medicine, etc. But I mean, we are catching up. So for example, there are policies. Many of the uh, uh, conference in computer science now when there is a, uh, an applied side, uh, set up an artifact evaluation committee that actually allows to look at the artifact association to paper check that they work. ACM has started a policy about uh, artifact reviewing and budging. I mean, these are, the team. there are discussions in many working groups in uh, the Research Data Alliance, data, not software, and then uh, for C11, which is another structure in the US. Some journals actually started to notice the issue and do something. The best I know of is IPOL, we'll come back to it, but there are a few others that are trying to, to allow you to actually put your artifact somewhere next to the paper. Then some generalist depositories that allow you to deposit any kind of data or things like Figshare or Zenodo or something like this. Well, a sequence of bit is a sequence of bit, right? So uh, they actually, added a tag which is called software and so if you deposit something which is a zip file that happens to contain software you you already saved your software but this is just software handled as just data which is not what i think is the best thing to do the point is that yes there has been an awakening but a lot has left to be done and if you look at what we actually need to address our needs and our concerns there are actually four things I, four issues that I believe we need to address, and I'm presenting them to you in what I believe to be, I mean, it's my personal opinion, or what it is the order of difficulty of addressing these issues well. The first issue, of course, not losing our software. So you need to have a place where archive, where we can archive the software, which is different from developing. Huh? I mean, archiving is a place where you put something that stays there. Uh, why? Because we need to make sure that later on when somebody reads the paper is able to retrieve it, no matter whether your GitHub account has gone away or something like this. Uh, this again is pretty easy to do. Uh, you put the zip file in a standard archive, not the best thing you can do, but that's easy. Uh, 
you can do it better, you will see how to do it, but uh, Afghani is not a big deal, not yet, no longer a big deal. Identifying software or referencing them, that's more complicated because now you need to find identifiers that will be there for the long term and which are appropriate for software. And we will see this is not what we are used to do for publications, it's a different issue. And this, of course, is important for reproducibility. Then if you want to find software or describe it, or know if you want to reuse, can you reuse it, what is the license, for example, then you need a proper metadata to describe it. And this is important for visibility and reuse. And finally, last but not least, how to go about citation and credit. Okay, so the software article should be properly cited, which is not the same reference. When I say cite, I think of giving credit to the authors. So for the first step is, who are the authors? And with software, that's much more complicated than one can think. And so if we actually want to address all these four things, A, R, B, C, which is kind of different from what people talk about in, in the data space, which is FAIR, F, A, I, R, uh, then we need infrastructure which are designed for software source code, not to just adapt other infrastructure built for data to handle source code. Now, the good news is today we have one. And this is the, the core of the presentation. So that, that, that was a big, big introduction, but just to, to give you the landscape of where we stand and what we need. So this uh, uh, infrastructure we have been building for some five years now, it is called software heritage. What is it? What is it? In a nutshell, this is, you can think is a kind of a library of Alexandria or source code, and it is built by an initiative whose goal is precisely to go out and collect every single line of source code for every piece of software that is still available. Preserve it, making sure we don't lose it, and share, making it accessible to everybody. Th there are three dimensions here. The past, preserving the past, the Apollo 11 source code. Uh, looking at what is going on right now, because it's not just an archive for dust, dust the old source code. It is for the lines of code written yesterday by one of your students or by yourselves. And a, a kind of tool to build better science in the future, the past, present, and future. And if you to materialize this a little bit, I mean, what software heritage is building is a reference catalog of all the software out there. Uh, of course, there is software in many, many different places, in particular open source software on guitar, on your in, uh, institutional code hosting platform, on the one of your friends or the European project or whatever. But the point is they're all spread around. I mean, we are building a single catalog where everything is indexed. We are building an archive. And again, think uh, again about what you do when you do software development. A code hosting platform where you work collaboratively on software is just the place where you go, you create a project, you work on it, then maybe you close it down, you move it elsewhere, you rename it, or the platform goes away, like Pictorious and, and Google Code. So there, it is not an archive. And we need an archive. And finally, last but not least, uh, we want to, to put the first brick in the world that is needed to build a, 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 a large telescope for analyzing the galaxy of software development worldwide, a kind of big research instrument for all of us. Our friends, and they have a friend in, in the space, in astrophysics managed to have beautiful instruments to, to, to observe the galaxy. We as researchers in computing, we should have a large instrument to actually observe the galaxy of software development, which is still not there. Well, this is an initiative. It has uh, taken time to build uh, support for it because it is a long-term undertaking. So you need both uh, visibility and support, people that share your vision and provide the message that this infrastructure is actually universal and not just a research project or just something that belongs to a particular country. That's the reason we, why we have agreements uh, uh, with UNESCO, and we work with UNESCO here and support from many, many, many organizations, including learning societies that you recognize. And on the other side, we had to bring together 
financial support because an infrastructure has a cost and you need to put the bill at the end, you make, make sure it will stay there for the long term. So the initial effort was made by INRI, I'm very grateful for that, them for doing that. But then the idea since day one, like for the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, and I was delighted to have Jean-Francois Dramatic, who was the first CEO of the World Wide Web Consortium, his advisor in building the strategy, we are trying to bring together a diverse set of stakeholders, of uh, um, funders and supporters, that goes from, from IT companies to banks, to, to telecom providers, uh, to the Ministry of Research in France, to different prestigious universities, the University of Paris, University of Pisa, that was mine, uh, the University of Bologna, the University of Quebec, uh, the uh, National Archives for Data in the Netherlands, and then different other organizations, including even co-hosting platforms like Pita and many others that will come later on. It is built for the long term, and it is thought as, uh, I, I do not have enough time, no, let's see. So, meaning for the long term is doing this, then also working to raise awareness about software source code. At UNESCO, actually, uh, a couple of years ago, we convened 40 experts worldwide. Paula was also there, I think she remembers. You, you can see her with the red dress in the picture. And uh, but there were people from any, any any kind of places. I mean, from private foundation to historians to librarians to, to universities, open source experts, etc. That ended up in a call in the Paris call about the importance of software source code, raising awareness about this. Okay, way beyond research. Uh, this code is published, and actually, if you want, you can sign it. And to do not lose time trying to, to write down, I will share the slides and the, the links are clickable, so you can go there after that. So this is a political overview of how it works. Again, as a strategy, we are building the largest software archive as a shared infrastructure, and the idea is to be just an infrastructure. So we want to enable application in cultural heritage, in industry, in research, in education, but we are not building any. So we provide the infrastructure on top of which people can build it. It's already complicated enough this way. And uh, if you look at the website that okay, we see the, later on, it is already the largest archive of software source code ever built. So uh, we have over 140 million uh, projects already archived today. Uh, and using a special structure, which is a Merkel direct acyclic graph that allows actually to deduplicate massively the content. And it's uh, almost 9 billion of uh, individual uh, source code files. Uh, you see uh, almost 40 million of different authors working on this. That, that's a huge archive. And uh, how is software heritage now addressing now I'm trying to connect what I told you before. Addressing these four needs, archive, reference, describe, cite. So the big, big mission of software heritage is more in the archive and reference area. But we also care about describe and cite. So in the slide that I'm going to show you, you will see archive and reference are very big, describe and cite are smaller, not because we we don't care about that, but because it is not the core mission. So for archiving and making sure nothing is lost, we have actually three different strategies. The first one, we are building a gigantic crawler for software source code. So we connect to tons of different code hosting platform out there, to GitHub, to GitLab, to instances of GitLab, to Bitbucket, to you name it and then to package managers or package distributions. And we proactively collect everything which is there. When we get all this data, you will find out that it's still a, a kind of a bubble tower. You need to connect it to all these different platforms that use all different APIs and languages. So you need adapter. But then when you have the list of projects hosted there, some are developed using a version control name, uh, system name and kit. Other use Mercurial, other use Darks, other use uh, Subversion, other use uh, you name it. Or if uh, you have packages, some are uh, G 
JavaScript packages or Camel packages, R packages, Debian packages, all different. So since we are not just build an old style archive, we are not building just an old style archive, we go the extra mile to actually build converters that convert each of these different formats into a single gigantic data structure, which is the, the, uh, uh, this gigantic Merkle graph where every file is connected to the directory where it is stored, that every directory is connected to the many, many, many different commits where it may appear. And the, these commits are connected to the many, many different origins where it can be uh, found. So this strategy actually allows you to get rid of the duplication that comes from fork, uh, either uh, explicit or implicit. And so this is harvesting. But we also have ways of allowing you to actually proactively add software to the archive. One is through a simple interface that doesn't require a username or nothing, which is save.software.org that allows you to trigger archival a particular repository, not necessarily yours, something that you need to enter archival reference, or a, an API for an explicit deposit, uh, which is called deposit software.org. This is for curated deposit. So this is what we do for archive. And then what about referencing? We use a sp special kind of identifier for reference of the artifacts which are in the archive, which are intrinsic identifier, decentralized, cryptographical strong identifier. The code name is SWHID, SWID, for software to identifier. This is standardized, normalized, nice supported by industry in an industry standard, which is called SPDX. It is also supported in Wikidata. The prefix is uh, register with Ayana. And uh, um, I will show you how it works in, 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 a, in a second, looking at the, um, the, the demo. But it, it, if, you, if you manage to see in the slide, you don't know if it is big enough. I mean, the identifier is basically a prefix, SWH. I mean, this is identifier software. Right? The version number, because the schema can evolve. So now it is SWH colon one. Then the kind of the object that is being identified. And this kind of object can be a, co a file content, a directory, a revision, a release, a snapshot of the, of the full uh, development system. And then you have a hash. And this is a hash which is computed on the file or through the Merkle tree structure uh, at the root of the, of the subtree or subgraph. That, uh, that you want to designate. So archive and reference, I think we have the best solution out there. Then the issue is what about describing software? Well, it's a mess. There are too many ontologies and metadata schema out there, but we are actually trying to, to work with one of the entities that is working on something called code meta and try to provide a means to add intrinsic metadata to the source code itself. So if you deposit a file in your source for the project, uh, and then we automatically recognize. And for citation, again, and giving credit, well, I do not know if you have been surprised, but I have been using LaTeX and BitTech for 35 years, maybe. There is not an entry for software. So I do not know what you do, but what I used to do, I was abusing the MISC entry in, in BibTech to, to some kind of message and a link to software. Really? I mean, in 35 years, we didn't have a style for citing software. That's unbelievable. Right? Well, fear not. I mean, thanks to the, to the lockdown, uh, I, I found time for a week to sit down. And now that you have a, a style designed for software, with latex software, available in CTAN, already in TechLive, uh, that they developed a few months ago, and you can cite software precisely. You will, we will see in, in the demo if you cite precise. But again, it is the full picture where we try to contribute, even if our main business is archiving and referencing. Now, that was long. And I think an example is worth a million words, okay? So let's try to look at some example of what this is. Now, Bear with me a second. I, I need to switch from this to the to the um, browser. So I need to stop sharing this. And I need to go to share. Uh, how can I share? Wait a second. This share. Ah, there are messages in the chat. No, 
department. So share mm, no application advanced. No. Where is the Chrome browser? You tab Chrome browser. It should be this one. Let's see if it works. Aha, uh -huh. it seemed to work. Do, do you see an empty uh, Chrome uh, browser? Okay, fantastic. Yes, oh, okay, so the first thing I would like to introduce you to the Software Heritage Archive itself. Okay, so if you go to archive.softwareheritage.org, as you see here, uh, you, see, you see an overview of what we are archiving. So the different platforms which are regularly harvested by our crawlers up to now, there are many things, very, very big platforms like GitHub, down to uh, small platforms like the INRIA institutional repository, for example, which is crawled regularly. Uh, or the Python package index, or uh, the NPM uh, JavaScript package index, or Debian, or, or uh, the CRAN, etc. Et ah, and you will see that, by, by the way, Google Code and Gitorios, I told you, they were shut down in 2015, but luckily we were already around. So we managed to salvage the one million and a half project before the platform were shut down. Everything is in there. So if you have old papers linking to software that was on Gitorio, on Google Code, which was my case, for example, we are not, you can, you can still find what you did. Uh, these are the actual number. You see now it changed a little bit from the picture that I showed in the slide because it changes every day. Now you can go in the archive and look, for example, for the Apollo 11 source code. The search functionality is, is bare bone for the moment. It's just in the URLs of the um, uh, repository that we have archived. Uh, full text search will recover require more money, more machines will come later. So for example, this is one of the many copies of the Apollo 11 source code which are available there. If you go to Luminary, for example, there is one that I like a lot. I mean, this burn, baby burn, master ignition routine of the, of the lamp, where you will see, again, a, li a little moment of pleasure, you see. The master ignition routine is designed for use by the following lamp programs, P12, P4, P42, P61, P63, okay? And uh, so, remember, we are in the 60s. So we are starting to learn programming. Now you need to handle five different kinds of commands that the astronauts can give. What do they do? And you have limited space, okay, what do they do? They have a single routine that actually handles these five tasks and the way the routines are, are accommodated to the different tasks is by pass, passing table of con constants. Okay? These are routines that actually turn on or off the rocket. So you see, variations among programs are accommodated by means of a table containing constants. So the, this again, messages to the other developer. And then, a little bit of ego pride here, the master initial routine was conceived and executed in the 60s, executed and written, and not been is maintained by Adler and Ice, brilliant engineers, which are, I don't, Ice is still, uh, still alive. And then you find this, only Swaki Malibans in the comments of the program. Uh, that, that would be a long story. I mean, if you, if you want to know, ask me in the question time, I'll tell you, otherwise I will go over time. And then when the, the real routines come here, it's so serious, you should not touch them because otherwise people die, it, it goes too late. In Noli setangere, don't touch unless you know what is going. You wouldn't expect that something like this in source code in the 60s, right? And, now you want to tell your friends. You want to put it in a blog post or in a paper. Okay, so you click on the first line, you shift click on the second line, and then you open this red uh, permalinks tab that you see here. Uh, so I need to, uh, uh, that you see here. And now you see, you can get the link to the file content we are seeing, the content here, 
or to the directory that contains it, or to the revision that contains it, or to the snapshot of the full state of development of the software uh, um, where this piece of file is contained. And when you go to this content uh, tab, for example, you can get either the simple software edge identifier, as I told you, the, the, the prefix, which is registered with IANA, uh, SWH, the version one, it is a content, a tag for the content, so it is exactly for this file, and then the hash. In this case, the only thing you know, it is the file that has the hash. You don't even know the file name or where it comes from. Or you can add contextual information. In this case, you know, actually, this file has been found harvested from the uh, repository uh, Apollo 11 in the Crystal Gary organization from GitHub. The state of the repository when we visited is identified by this snapshot identifier. The file name is actually the path to the file is luminary, burn by the burn, etc. The lines I'm interested in highlighted at 58 uh, to 72. And this file is inside the revision, the anchor in the graph, which is uh, identified by this identifier. So if you have this and you copy this permalink, you can copy the identifier of the permalink. The permalink is just a, a resolver concatenated with the identifier. Then if you put in a paper of yours or in a blog post or in Twitter or wherever, and you actually paste it, you click on it, I'm simulating clicking by pasting in a new tab. What happens is that you are brought exactly to the same place in the archive. My connection goes, let's see, come on. Here it is, you see? So I'm brought exactly in the same place in front of the same fragment of code, but it is not just that. Look up, you see, you have the full context. It is inside the same revision with the same author name, okay? In, in, a, in the same branch in exactly the same path. So you have exactly all the information needed to bring your reader or yourself to exactly the same place where it was. So this is a functionality which is also available on code hosting platform. But the big difference with code hosting platforms is that code hosting platform go away and project go away and the identifier on code hosting platform are all different. While in software heritage, the identifiers are all the same. It doesn't matter if it comes from a Git repository, a subversion repository, a package, whatever. The presentation is uniform, the data structure is uniform, the identification system is the same. Okay. Once you do this, then you can, you can start writing papers in a way which is something I wanted to do for decades. I do not have time to go through all the demos because I, I had to fire the tone, but I speak too long, too much. So let me just show you one case. So this is one article, let me put it big. One article that I wrote with a friend this year about a replication experiment uh, on a software source code that we wrote together in 1998, say 22 years ago. We wanted to see if it was possible to still run it. I mean, the big surprise, it was, it, it was written in OCaml, beautiful language, so uh, just compile and run still today, uh, 22 years ago. The big difficulty was finding the source code. I have to admit, I lost it, okay. but we found it. And guess where? In software heritage. How? Because somebody posted it to Gitorios, but Gitorios has gone, but we saved it, so we found it. Incredible. So I, I could kind of get back all the history of the system. And now this paper described the experiment, what we did. And if you look at the, what happens, you see now the code is available at this address, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you have the software edge ID all over the, 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 the paper uh, that allows you to, for example, do things like this. Let me see if I can uh, find the part which is here.
So in the paper I'm explaining we needed to change a line to make it work, just one line, and this is the line we needed to change. And you see in the paper I can put the precise reference to it. Uh, now, the other thing which is interesting is that when, when we mention in the paper the different things that we can do uh, on the article. For example, here this is an excerpt of the source code which was in the original paper. And then we can again uh, go to the exact, uh, to the exact uh, release and version of the file that has been used for this particular application. All the paper is done like this. And if I can go back to the um, bibliography, sorry, not very structured my presentation here. In the bibliography, what you see that now you have real entries real entries for software, which are clearly identified, which are written using the spatial extension of uh, um, BibLatex, which is dedicated to software. So you have the possibility of mentioning software, like this one, but also software releases, of a particular version, or software excerpts, fragments of code. It, you see, and so again, if you click here on the software release, you end up on the particular version of the source code you are interested in. If you click on, on a particular uh, excerpt, excerpt link, then you get the, the, the fragment of code that was actually meant to be shown to you in, in, uh, in the program. So I'm, I'm, I'm very speeding up a little bit too much in, in this. I'm sorry for not being very because um, I'm seeing the time is running up. But again, this is a way of changing the way we actually can uh, write your papers. And now, what about if the piece of software you're interested in is not already in the archive? That is very easy. You can go to this particular page, which is called Save Code Now. And there you can tell our system, the crawler, for, for now, there are three version control systems which are supported, Git, Subversion, and Mercurial. You can put here the origin that you're interested in. For example, I do not know, I mean, this uh, uh, project by Len Schustek on, on, on GitHub. You submit the request for archival, and that's it. No, no, no username, no sign up, no login, nothing. And then you see in the browse, solve, uh, save request uh, tab, you see all the requests that has been uh, submitted. So the one I just submitted is this one, has been accepted because it is an origin we know, it is not yet scheduled to be. If it is a strange place we do not know, this end up on the, on the desk of one of the engineers that checks it is actually a legitimate piece of source code before accepting it and whitelisting it, and then it goes on. You have seen there has already been 11,000 requests manually submitted by people that wanted their, their software to be archived. Imagine you have to write a paper and your software is on some repository somewhere, you want it to be archived to have the proper software identifier, so you just go in there and start to see. Okay, so I, I will stop the, 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 the demo part here and go back because I have eaten up a lot of time, so let me move to the end of the story. In this slide that you have here, you will have the, the copy of my slides. All the blue things are links. So you can follow all these links by yourself and try many, many other things by yourself. Uh, before uh, concluding, a few words on what is going on here. First of all, a remark on the identifiers, right? Because what you have seen are strange identifiers. If you are a developer, you are familiar with them. I mean, when you use a distributed version control system, we all use these kinds of identifiers, even if each version control system has another one. If you are not a developer, you may wonder why not using other identifiers you are more familiar with, like in DOIs, for example, for identifying software. So let me take a few seconds to tell you a little more about the trust, trust model in the systems of identifiers. Think a little bit about identifiers. There are actually two general classes of system of identifiers. 
intrinsic identifiers which are actually computed from the object. There you do not need a register. Okay. For example, the chemical notation. If you find on a paper NaCl, that's a, a, chlorur, chlorur, a sodium chlorure, that is a, a table salt. Okay. You don't need to, to, to click on a link to know what it is. It is a standard coding of that particular object in chemistry. And there are thousands of components, but the standard coding allows you to have the, a uniform system identifier which is computed from the object. In music, it's similar. In computing, we have hashes, and now you have soft edge identifier. These are intrinsic identifier, no registry needed, and persistent in the long term. Then you have extrinsic identifiers. These are assigned to you by an authority, and it needs a registry, and it needs an authority. Your passport number. There is no connection between your password number and you. It is not the hash of your DNA sequence. Okay? It's just a number given you by an authority. All of the usual system of identifier we use in academia, DOIs, ARKI, RRD, etc., etc., are extrinsic identifier. Okay, so you have an authority in the register. And so the trust model, and there is the dedicated blog post on this if you want to look at uh, it. The trust model is pretty different between the first and the second. If you have a, an extrinsic identifier and you try to retrieve a piece of thing, of data associated to it, you need to go into the registry that tells you, ah, this identifier corresponds to this URL. Okay, so you follow the URL, you go to the software archive, get the software in there, that maybe has a checksum, but this checksum is just to ensure it is not corrupted during transmission. And then you get it, but you need to trust the full red zone here. It means anybody in this full red zone could change the content that you wouldn't notice if you only have the identifier. With intrinsic identifier, that's pretty different because if my identifier is computed from the object, when it fetch the object, then I just check if computing the identifier from the object give the same result. In that case, I'm sure. And that's it. The only thing I need to trust is the algorithm, okay? The, the hashing routine. So it has no, no bugs or something like this. So it's a very, very different thing when you think about it long term. And so the road ahead. Uh, first of all, adoption is coming. So in France, we have this national access portal that uh, now allows people to deposit software. There are just a couple of hundred deposits done right away. But this is curated deposit. So they, then it goes to software heritage. It is a metadata which is curated. Uh, SW Math, which is a beautiful archive for mathematical software, links into software edge for long term reference to, to the software they describe. Journals, I mean, the image processing online, which is an incredible journal uh, uh, that actually publishes articles by al algorithm with associated full source code actually archives and reference software in, in, in software heritage. It actually even provides for you the bibliotech template for the, for the software they publish. Uh, just this weekend, uh, uh, somebody from the Journal of Theoretical and Computation and Applied Mechanics uh, 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 got in touch to let us know that now there are instruction for authors that recommend archival in software heritage, and they included the bibliotech software uh, package in their journal class to allow people to cite software in that particular way. From the policy level, you have uh, in France a national plan for open science includes uh, uh, software edges in infrastructure. And we have published self-archival guidelines with the full ICMS paper, which is available online and that you can look at. Uh, let, let me be clear, this is not telling what a beautiful work we did. This is not my goal. I'm just telling you, we are starting from zero. There was nothing. To get adoption and to have an infrastructure that serves all our needs, it takes a lot of effort. It takes advocacy. It takes time. It takes convincing people, telling friends like you in our community. That's a pleasure to, to be with you today about this. It takes a lot of time. I mean, and it's only now, I mean, five years after starting this, that this adoption is actually starting to take place. I'm telling you how long and how difficult it is to get here. And the breaking news, and you know, uh, I mean, it happened again. Okay, Bitbucket, another popular platform, announced almost one year ago that they were going to close down support for Mercurial, which endangered a quarter of a million of research projects. Okay, uh, and 
So we, we noticed that, so we teamed up with Octopus, so they are experts about this mercurial version control system, get funded by a, 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 a foundation in the Netherlands, NNN. Uh, and in July, just a, a few months ago, Bitbucket erased 250,000 repository, but in August we were ready and you had the archive live. So everything that was in Bitbucket is live. And what is funny is that we got this tweet by a, a researcher in astrophysics that you can read it. I mean, just realize that Bitbucket disabled all the repositories uh, when Somebody informed me that the link associated with an older pattern of mine was down. I thought all was lost, but some, someone archived all the repo, very classy move by Octobus and Softrise, and he found all the stuff there. So the bottom line here is that, of course, explicit deposit telling people you need to go and deposit today is important and we must promote it, but it's not enough. And not everybody will do it. And what about people who are not researchers, do not want to archive in the node or something like this? We need to collect everything to make it work. So let me finish here. I think the key message that I wanted to deliver is that we all need to take responsibility to make sure research software becomes a first class citizen. So at least making sure it is properly archived, properly referenced, properly described, and properly cited. So you can now already, if you want, Leverage this infrastructure, which is software heritage, in the conferences, in the journal, in the artifact evaluation committee for archival and for reference. You can finally cite software, at least if you, if you use LaTeX. I think Word is more complicated, but I mean, in deep LaTeX, software is there. And also, another thing, if I can, and if I may, we have been part of a conversation about software citation and software evaluation for at least a couple of years. I have to say, I didn't see enough colleagues in there. It's an important conversation. So if you do not want to succumb to number games again in five years, where you will have a Shanghai uh, class, classification of a software producing university or something that's built on strange indicators, this is a moment to join the conversation and tell how you want to have your research software evaluated and cited properly. Don't let other people do it for you. Then finally, a point I could not talk about today, and sorry, I mean, it's very complicated to, 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 to shrink five years of work into a few, a few slides, the, even if I talk a lot. The, there are incredibly interesting scientific problems in building this infrastructure, just in building it. I mean, big code, automatic classification, distributed infrastructure, it's in, an incredible playground. This will need to wait for another moment. But just to, to, to hint the fact that if you come and look at uh, uh, our blogs of publication, we see there is ground for a lot of people and we need, we, we as a community, we need to take care of these issues. So sorry again for being so long. I think I will stop here with a big thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer any question you may have. The slides will be available online. There are some papers if you want to look at some of the things related to these issues. And I'm all yours. Thank you, Roberto. Very interesting talk, a high rele relevant topic. And I myself have a lot of questions, but I would first uh, let the others ask. So Simon had a question. Simon, do you like to ask? I think it is more likely if you ask rather than I read it from the chat. Okay. Okay, I can, I can try. <laughs> if I can still remember the, my question. Uh, so I understand that you, uh, you import part of the software from uh, different repositories uh, into, our, um, into the archive automatically and that there's also manual uh, deposit. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is um, is whether there is any sense, uh, whether that, that makes any sense to apply some kind of filter or threshold saying, okay, at this point, my software is, is good to be deposited in the archive, or at this point, this software, which lies somewhere on GitHub, it has to be imported or not. So is there, does that make any sense to filter, or is it easier to just import everything? And then if it's, mm -hmm. uh, if, if it doesn't have any impact, it will be just lost uh, as unconnected dot on the graph. 
Th thanks a lot, Simon, for this is a very important question. I mean, it's a key question where you are building an archive. What is your curation policy? I mean, what deserves to be archived? What does not deserve to be archived? I have to say that our strategy is to the antipode of what you see in traditional libraries. I mean, if you go to the National Library, you want to, for example, then to have one of the books that you self-publish for yourself, they will just tell you very gently to go away. I mean, it doesn't deserve to go in the National Library. Mm -hmm. In software, we took the opposite approach to actually archive everything we get can get our hands on because being part of the archive is not the label of quality. It is just making sure it is there in case this object you are developing now that can evolve tomorrow, I mean, software evolves, may become important later on. So it, it, the mantra is, we do not archive software only because we know its value. We archive all software because we cannot know what value it will have. And I have a concrete example. I remember in 1995, uh, I saw this mes message by, by Erasmus Lerdorf, which was the original author of PHP. He wrote a single line in the Usenet that said, hmm, I'm fed up of writing HTML page by hand. I, 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 wrote up a little bit of tricky, hacky library. PHP was personal home page tools, okay? Take mm -hmm. it, it's free. So would you have archived that in 1995? Probably not, okay? Today, it is unfortunately the most popular programming language for, gra for, uh, for, uh, for writing web pages. So you do not know at the beginning. So we prefer to archive everything. Interesting thing will be pointed at from article, web page, et cetera. Non-interesting thing, we'll just sediment to the, to the lower level. And thanks to this Merkel DAG, we do not have space problem, space issues <laughs> up to now. It's not okay. yet. So Hans Dieter has also a question. Yes, my question is, uh, is it also possible to put into the uh, Software Heritage Archive any software that does not make use of version control uh, Absolutely, very, very good point. So we, um, we, you can actually put in software any kind of software, but uh, 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 there are some subtleties here. So uh, we also track a package managing system. So for example, if your software is just a package in the, in uh, CRAN or in CTAN or in CPAN or whatever, I mean, any, any of the archives out there which are recognized, we, we, we harvest it regularly also. What we d did not enable is the ability to uh, trigger archival for anybody without identification of zip files or tar files, because I do not want us to become mega upload. Okay, so it, but if you want to deposit a piece of software, which is just a zip file or a tar file, etc., uh, we have agreement with these open access portals, for example, in, in France, Hall, if you want, you can deposit a tar file or whatever. It is moderated by the people of the open access repository because we are. We are also working with Zenodo right now to extend Zenodo in such a way that there will be direct archival in software heritage. In that case, you can just deposit on Zenodo, it will come to software heritage. If it is a version control system, it is much better to, do, to go directly to save code now because in that case, you get the full history archive. If you go to the node, the only thing that you get archived is the tar or the zip that you identify or the status of your repository. Okay. So the reason why you cannot right now anonymously deposit a tar file is that the danger of getting crap is too high. Okay. So we prefer to go through other things. But we are working on that. So we see that the topic is very interesting and a lot of people have questions. So Vadim and Antoine have still questions and I think afterwards we need to close in order to give some time for the next session. But the two questions I would suggest gets to take. Okay, thank you. So to, to save time on, on reading the question, the question is what do you do with uh, attribution? Right, so uh, people can have different account names and, and whatnot and if you really want to give them credits then uh, uh, you want to do something with it. So w just in short, what, what do you do? Absolutely. Now, let, let, let me clarify because, uh, again, probably my presentation on this point was not clear enough. 
So as software average, we do not provide credit to anyone. So we just keep track of all the version control system. You have all the information about the Git log, what is the pseudonym of people, et cetera, et cetera. But this is not what I believe is the right way of giving credit. The right way of giving credit is actually promoting the use of proper metadata, which is curator that contains information about you, your authors, et cetera. And I do not think it is a good idea to just extract automatically from the version control system a list of names, because in this list of names, you could have uh, bots. I mean, you have a uh, continuous integration bots and crap and things, and maybe somebody that just suggested you to change a comma. This is not an author. And you will never have the person that actually designed the algorithm and, and worked with it engineers to make sure it works properly, who didn't write the code or she didn't write the particular Java code because she only knows OCaml, for example, but she deserves to be mentioned. So this is a political work that the team developing the software need to do. The same way we do this political work when we decide who is the author or not in a paper. Okay, who is in the front page, who is in the acknowledgement, and who is just uh, somebody I offer a coffee to him because we, we chatted. You see, this political work in software need to be done by the team. There is not an editorial board doing this. So what we do, we provide support through this uh, LaTeX software extension to actually do a proper work, but the political work is up to the team. And we also provide uh, tools to write metadata that can be in, embedded in your system if you have your own agreement on who, who should decide. That's much better than trying to extract it from the version control system. Okay, thank you very much. And very cool initiative, by the way. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. So the last question from Antoine. Do you like to ask or should I read? Okay, so for times and I think I, I will read. So the question is, what is the policy for removing elements from the archive? Ah, okay, that's a very interesting question also. Entities. Very interesting question too. So the, the general principle, and you will see this, it's a very similar thing that happens in, uh, in, uh, in open access archive. There has been a debate in France in, in, uh, about PAL for a while. Uh, what happens if somebody wants to remove a paper from, from the open access archive? Well, the general answer from the archive is no. I mean, it was public, it will stay there. And, and this is, it can be very touchy, okay? Because maybe you, you did some plagiarism and you want to get rid of the proofs of your plagiarism, you just want to remove the paper that contains some plagiarism. The answer is no, we keep it because we are an archive. So our answer is we do not provide easy means of removing things because we are an archive, but we are legally obligated to uh, answer to request of uh, removal uh, as any other content provider. And you have specific legal provision for doing this. So it is not a one-click removal. Because, it, I mean, this is content that is under copyright, etc. So you need to prove you are your owner. You need to prove you have removed it from every other place around the world. You need to prove a bunch of other things. And this, for the moment, is under um, French law because the, the servers are in France. And since the servers are in France, we, we are submitted to French law. So there is a precise procedure to follow it. But our general approach is, don't be shy, please share what you have. It, this is not a label of quality, just make it easy for people to understand what has going on in the software development world, in the research world for the future. So, and then of course, if there are deep issues, strong reason to remove something, there is a procedure in place for doing this, but it takes time and it goes through the legal department, which is reasonable. I mean, because uh, you need to prove it is yours, by the way. Not enough to say this is this is my account on GitHub is not enough for the for a legal department. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Roberto. So very interesting talk. We see we have also more questions. So this room is there uh, now in the coffee. I, I'm I'm I will stay here if you somebody has more questions. Please exactly. do not hesitate. Exactly. I'll be happy to answer, and, and, and the other can take a coffee. And thanks a lot yeah. for your time. So please continue the discussion unmoderatedly. Um, in this online world, we need to live with the possibilities that we have. So uh, you can continue and others perhaps like to get a cup of coffee. And then we meet again in about 15 minutes and 10.30. We start with the next session on static and runtime, runtime analysis. So thank you once more for the inspiring talk, Roberto, and hope to see you all at the next session. 
thanks, thanks a lot. And nice, nice, nice to be with you again. It's a real pleasure, even if virtually. <laughs> Roberto. Yes. Um, so you talk about uh, Ilko here. So you talk about repositories going away, like uh, yes. or was it Bitbucket? How yes. do you ensure that, that the server archive doesn't go away? Ah, very interesting question. So it's a, it's a, it, it was a kind of a big issue since day one because we wanted to set up a strategy to make sure things don't go away. So there are very various levels of um, uh, measures in our strategy to ensure, and, well, ensuring, you know, that nothing is sure in this world. But anyway, what, what is the best we can do? Number one, uh, we decided not to create a company because company mm -hmm. can, can be bought and sold and shut down. So we are going for the creation of an independent international organization, probably a foundation. Uh, if you but at, the, at the moment you're in a university, is that the uh... yes, at the moment, the current status. Uh, okay, let, let if you have a little bit of time, I will explain you really in detail. So my strategy was over 15 years. So the first five years incubation at INRIA. So all the project is working at INRIA to show the world we can do this. I believe now we are at the point that this first phase has ended. So we are providing functionality service that people can test and track, you can do it. And so you can see how it works. Then the second period of five years more or less is a transition to the final steady state. And the final steady state is an independent international organization with proper legal status recognized as an archive. So the, currently, just, just in this very moment, uh, UNESCO has set out a, a call for tender for expert advice on the best organization that could be created to cater for software research in the long term. And, and this is part of our collaboration with UNESCO. But, I mean, that's the first point. So we do right. not but, want to depend- foundations on... go away too, right? I mean, that's- Absolutely, uh... absolutely. That was just the first point. <coughs> then the second point is how do you ensure money can be there? Okay. Now, the first step on the foundation is on the value laws, you actually write that your mission is preserving this. So you cannot be bought, you cannot be shut down unless you don't have any money. And what about the money? So we, as you have seen in the, in the sponsor uh, slide, uh, we are addressing four or five different kinds of stakeholders. So this is diversification of the funding uh, stream, right. uh, which is again another mitigation strategy to, to not depend on just one thing. And in particular, if you, well, I don't have the slides here, but we try to depend as little as possible on project money, because you cannot run an infrastructure on project money. Mm -hmm. the project has a start and an end. You can use project money to extend an infrastructure, not to run it. And this is a big issue with the European project in this space, for right. example. Uh, and, and so we are working on donations and convincing people to be on board for the for sharing, mutualizing the cost of infrastructure, the address is needed. But even that is not enough because anything can happen. So we have a, a third level of strategy, which is building an international network of mirrors Software heritage, which are full copies of the archive or the infrastructure, which are maintained and run by other organizations. So they are independent on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the idea is that if at some moment one of the nodes of this network we are trying to build will go away, the other node can take up. Right. Currently, we have an agreement with Sweden, with a private company in Sweden. And with the Enea, which is a large research organization in Italy. They are building two mirrors right now. They are not built yet. So, yes, I do not have guarantees today that software will not go away, but we are really, really trying to do our best to make sure that whatever happens, the data will be there and, and uh, the effort will not be lost. The yeah. final okay, level so... is trying to get to a European level and try to convince the European Union that this is a new infrastructure which is important for research and to get a regular funding also from the European Union, not just from companies all around the world. 
but it's a long work and here you can help spread the work and try mm -hmm. to convince more people to come on board. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I mean, uh, you have, you have, uh, it's not a single server. That no, you're not at all. No, up to now we have uh, two in-house uh, copies. I use the term copy as different from copies. A full copy on uh, Azure servers in Europe, which are sponsored by Microsoft, and another full copy on uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, which is uh, on Amazon servers in Europe also. But the four are under our control. What mm -hmm. I want are mirrors, which are not under my control. Right. And how big are they? I mean, what is the, uh, the footprint? Uh, you, you will be surprised. It is half a petabyte. It's not much, because mm -hmm. I, by doing this uh, this um, Merkle tree compression, I mean it's uh, you deduplicate a lot. So if you have uh, one thousand, and actually we have thousands of copies of the Linux kernel, we just store one, and then you have links, which are very very small footprint. Great. Okay. Um, well, at least I will start. Uh, Telling my PhD students about this and that they should yeah, so uh, to play with it and you see them. Yes. Very cool. Thanks. Thank I need to uh, go to uh, go go get, get the coffee. Sorry, I, I will not. No, no. I need to lecture. So. Uh, oh. Okay. That's uh, good. Good luck. Day job. All right. Good See you later. Uh, yeah, Roberto. Sorry if I keep you around. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, my mic wasn't working earlier when I tried to oh, ask the question. Sorry. So I asked the question about the removal policy. Sure. The reason why I ask this is because I know a lot of companies, for instance, would hate to have some software that, for instance, are for security researchers or in particular. Sure. Uh, you, you know what I mean by this, because uh, there's a lot of uh, touchy feelings where people, where companies or governments wants to censor some research yeah. in particular. And so I guess the servers being in Europe is okay for most of the, the governments that like to shut down research in general. Yes. But I'm not sure about how, if you had any pressure or, or not. At uh, that okay, place thanks. Yet. Thanks, Antoine, for clarifying what you were thinking about. So I answered a different question from this one before. But so, they're both what I wanted, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but you are right. And you know, one of the reasons why we are trying to set up an international independent organization under the umbrella of UNESCO is exactly what you are saying. So uh, we must make sure that it will be difficult for any single player around the world, be it a company, be it an individual, be it a state, the government to actually pressure the organization to do something which is not part of its mandate. And so if you want to get there, it's, it's important to, to have this independent structure and multi-stakeholders on board. It's really fundamental. And, and we are not there yet, but this, this is actually essential for the future to have this uh, uh, Ideally, I mean, if you could dream about this, if you could have uh, the organization set up under a common protocol of agreement by different member states of the UNESCO constituency, that would be a pretty good uh, uh, way of uh, preserving the independence of the organization and avoiding this kind of pressure. Because, you know, today, we believe that being in Europe is safe because uh, we, I know, and I think we are right for a moment because we do not feel this kind of pressure, but you never know. Remember people in 1925, 26, they thought that Europe was a perfectly nice place to be. And look at what happened like about 15 years later. So it's better to have a, it's better to have a really international organization behind it. Yeah, yes, I agree. Uh, well, this is a really good initiative because I personally am interested in, in general replication. And all Absolutely. Things. And I already found my projects in there. So that's ah, good. fantastic. Because, because I put them on the Unreal uh, GitHub, GitLab. So they're already there. So that's really good. Uh, uh, thank you. This is very, very interesting for me, particularly.
uh, so I'll be keeping track of it. Thank you. Okay, and if you if you find your project, you will see that when you visit the, the, the page corresponding to your project on Software Edge, there is a small uh, button that save, says uh, take a new snapshot or I don't remember the name. So if it is not up to date as much as you want, because we regularly crawl, but we are not Google, you do not have the resources of Google, so you cannot crawl every two seconds or two minutes or two days. Just yeah, yeah. My, my projects are usually archived in the sense that they're an artifact related to a paper, so they don't. Ah, okay, so it's fine. So, so it's fine in, in, in this case. Uh, but I, I was wondering if I should do it as branches, comments, as an archive. But now that I have this linking strategy, I can just post it on the institution GitHub and then save it and then just link it from there, which is much, much easier than just directly linking the, the GitHub or the GitLab. Yeah. Thank you very much for this. It's very useful because I always link artifacts in my papers. So. Absolutely, fantastic. And, and uh, try to play with this uh, bibliotech software extension. It's actually pretty, pretty fun. You can find it on, on CTAN. Okay, okay, that's very, very useful. Yeah, because we also use the miscellaneous uh, instruction all the time. So. Okay. Yeah, I can relate to that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not gonna take more time from you. <laughs> So that, right. that the new set, next session starts in a couple of minutes. So maybe yeah, this exactly. is the time to say thanks a lot for all, uh, to all of you and say goodbye. And and uh, and now I need to move to another meeting, unfortunately. But I mean that's life. <laughs> thank you, Roberto. It was really very inspiring. Thanks a lot, Erica. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye bye.